has your health at heart. That's why we're bringing you a new subscription plan that allows you to access great services to take better care of your health and to help you control the cost of health care. All Health Go gives you access to unlimited telehealth doctor consultations directly from your mobile device and at no additional cost. In addition, you can also reach emotional counselors if you ever need to. The subscription plan also gives you access to your own patient advocate who can help you navigate the complexities of the healthcare system and a great number of tools that help you negotiate medical bills, locate services in your area at the right price, and secure great discounts. Subscribe now for as little as 55 cents a day and start enjoying this great service. Visit gocare.tv. Living Minute, a look at the latest in medical innovations changing our lives. Students are going back to school, and that's got many parents, teachers, and school administrators concerned as cases of the highly contagious COVID-19 Delta variant continue to rise. Many are now advocating for a nationwide COVID-19 testing program in schools, taking advantage of the $10 billion in funding made available by the Biden administration. One such program, Ready, Check, Go, was recently launched by Thermo Fisher Scientific. It maps out a streamlined protocol for students K-12 through to swab and submit samples for testing each day. Experts say testing in schools is a critical step to monitor and control the pandemic. For more on the program, visit livingminute.tv and click on the thermofisher.com slash readycheckgo banner. Support for this program is provided by Baptist Health through the John and Margaret Krupa Distinguished Chair Fund. While there have been many advances and medical breakthroughs over the years, breast cancer remains one of the conditions that women fear the most. Breast cancer is often curable when discovered early, but in far too many cases, it's discovered at a later stage, especially in women of color. According to the National Cancer Institute, breast cancer mortality is about 39% higher in black women than in white women. And black women are often diagnosed at a younger age. Hispanic women are more likely to be diagnosed with later stage breast cancer than non-Hispanic white women, according to the American Cancer Society. There are many factors involved, but lack of access to affordable health care may play a significant role. There is help available, and that's why we are here. We want all women to know about the preventive screenings that they need to help diagnose breast cancer early and the treatments available to save lives. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Welcome to Breast Cancer in Women of Color, a Smart Life Town Hall. We have a fantastic panel of experts joining us today. We start with Nancy Brinker, founder of Susan G. Komen and co-founder of The Promise Fund. Also joining us, Dr. Haywood Brown, Senior Associate Vice President, Faculty and Academic Affairs at University of South Florida Health. Dr. Jane Mendez, Chief of Breast Surgery at Miami Cancer Institute. And finally, Dr. Jessica Contreras, Radiation Oncologist at Miami Cancer Institute. Welcome to all of you. Thanks Thank for you having for having us. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, Mrs. Brinker, I'd like to start with you, if possible. You are the founder of the Susan G. Komen Foundation and also the co-founder of the Promise Fund of Florida. You have spent decades, and I mean decades, helping women fight breast cancer. I'd like you to talk about what motivated you and how things have changed over the years. Thanks, Olga. Well, 40 years ago, I made a promise to my sister, Susie, before she died. 
at the age of 36 that I would do everything I could to cure breast cancer. I founded Susan G. Komen to do just that. We raised over $3 billion for research, education, and treatment. We increased awareness of the disease all over the world. But somehow I knew that wasn't enough. I am still haunted by memories of sitting next to Susie at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where we watched dozens of low-resourced women sitting on the floor waiting to see an oncologist. It was at that moment that Susie turned to me and said, where a woman lives shouldn't matter whether she lives. We've come so far, but when it comes to every woman having access to quality care, Susie's vision is still not fulfilled. And that is why I, along with a small group of like-minded women and men, have now created the Promise Fund of Florida. Our mission is to screen under-resourced women to avoid late-stage diagnosis of breast and cervical cancer, two of the largest cancer killers of women. We're building a gold standard community health model that can be replicated across the country. We've partnered with Hologic, a medical technology company, and FoundCare, a federally qualified health center, where we have launched the Promise Fund Mammography Screening Center. We have educated, screened, navigated with our partners 10,000 women since last January. Over my career, I've seen how transforming healthcare outcomes can transform whole communities and hence societies. I will be dedicating my last quarter of my life to ensuring that every woman will have access to the care they need. These were my promises to Susie, and I intend to fulfill them. And thank you very much. Olga. Thank you so much, Mrs. Brinker. What an amazing journey you've had, and we do appreciate all you have done for women out there. We're actually going to talk more about the Promise Fund of Florida, but first, I'd like to share with our viewers some statistics that are somewhat startling. Look at this. Mortality rates in black women are nearly 40% higher than white women. And now let's look at Hispanic women. They are diagnosed with more late stage breast cancer than white women. So Dr. Brown, let me turn to you now, if I may. You are a national expert in breast cancer and in health disparities. What roles do access to care and affordability play in getting women in communities of color to be screened for breast cancer? Well, thank you for that question. The idea that access is the biggest challenge we have uh, with women being able to get to a facility. I have to remind people that we live very, in a very rural country for the most part. We live in urban centers too. But the reality is 50% uh, of all counties don't have a practice in OBGYN. And so access to care is a real issue. The other issue is economics. How are you going to pay for it when you get there if you don't have any resources? And that's a big aspect of it. And the other component of it is fear and denial. And these are the reasons for the delays in diagnosis that I think we see uh, more of a factor of women of color, African-American women as a result, and Hispanic women who are diagnosed at a later stage and therefore have a, di a higher mortality. And Dr. Mendez, I wanna pick up on that in terms of fear and denial. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, fear is actually the worst um, enemy of the patients. You know, fear of finding something or fear of a potential diagnosis. And actually, and that's a conversation that I oftentimes have to have with my patients because that's their worst enemy. And if you don't seek action, even if you have an abnormality, certainly that will delay your diagnosis. So fear is an issue that we have to address directly with our patients. It's real. I want to move on to Dr. Camille Clare. She's a professor and chair of the Department of OBGYN at the State University of New York Downstate Health Services University. She spoke to us about the importance of having racial concordance with patients. Let's take a listen. I think specifically for Black women, we know that um, racial concordance between your healthcare provider and the patient is very, very important. So there are studies uh, an Oakland study in California that looked at black men in particular 
and there being uh, recommended a bunch of different interventions and whether they were willing to accept those interventions based on the same racial background of their physician. So I think for Black women, it's very similar. They have a trusted provider, someone that they're able to meet with, relate to, uh, talk to, have their questions answered, um, hear the lived experiences that, are, that may be similar. I think that's very, very important in establishing that relationship so that patients, um, my patients, are, will most likely follow the recommendations that I offer, talking to them about it, saying why mammogram is important, uh, what is their individual risks. I think that has really played a factor in my ability to talk to patients about any of the screening uh, recommendations that I offer, including mammograms. She made so many great points there. Dr. Contreras, I want to go to you. That relatability, how mm. important is that? Oh, it's possibly the most important thing anyone can have, right? Your patients have to trust you. And if they think that you understand where they're coming from or if they, you know, you speak the same language as, as they do, it makes a huge difference because it helps establish that trust. Um, and that really helps patients proceed with treatment and continue with follow-up care. And Mrs. Brinker, that trust is so important. So many women trust you for all you have done. Talk about that trust with the doctor and how important that relationship is to then create that awareness and that we still need to work on today. Well, we do. And um, the fact is, uh, and, and it's wonderful, and so many people do enjoy trust with their physicians, but the fact is the time you get to spend with a, finish, a physician is very short. And so we always suggest that there's a navigator on hand or one who can guide the patient and talk to them and or a nurse who can answer questions about uh, the indications of a drug that they've been given or uh, how they are to, to recognize other symptoms of what they may have. It's very important though to have this trust. And, and it really is everything because everything we've been talking about, fear, uh, not showing up for screenings, not coming for regular uh, treatment is always faced with a lot of fear. And I want to now uh, turn to something that is so prevalent, so real, which is a lack of insurance. We spoke to Dr. Scarlett Constant. She's a community physician, and she actually talked about what she thinks is a major part of the access to health care. Again, lack of insurance. Take a listen. The lack of insurance is just it's just terrifying. What is happening is, you know, a, a lot of people are, uh, have jobs that will pay for their insurance or they'll, you know, they'll pay for a portion. And what's happening is the hourly wages are not enough to cover their portion of the insurance. So we'll find a lot of people opting out or they'll get a Medicaid HMO for their children, but not for themselves. Uh, there's a, a, there is a large portion of patients that do not have medical insurance. And without the medical insurance, you therefore are not going to see a PCP. You're not getting your regular screenings. And even if there are free mammograms being offered or the mammogram ban and things like that, you don't even have the education to go get it done. That's not something that's on your list because you don't have someone that is speaking to you and educating you and helping you go ahead and make that decision to do that. Furthermore, if you do get the mammogram, who are you gonna follow up with when it's, when it's abnormal? So this is a very big problem in the community. Insurance is a huge issue. And again, it's, it's, it's that link in having insurance, having a PCP, having a medical home, having someone that you can trust that will guide you and push you and tell you to get this done. I really want the whole panel to chime in on this one. Dr. Brown, I'm gonna uh, start with you. Can you expand on your feelings in terms of this lack of insurance and what a big problem it is? Well, it's no question that it's a big problem. And of course, when you think about the working individuals, and this is the reason that we talk about, um, you know, what, the things that we hear politically, but not having insurance is a big deterrent. So even if you're familiar with, if you're smart enough to be familiar with all the guidelines, you've turned 40 years old, you have a next door neighbor who had breast cancer, if you can't afford to go in and get the mammogram, and then you have to travel 30 to 40 miles to get it. Those are factors that will play a role in the delay. But at least if you had an ability to pay, when someone says I'm 40 and I know I'm going in to see my primary care doctor and they're gonna recommend this, and that makes a difference. So it's no question, the economic factors are the reasons for delay, access are reasons for delay, and it's a sad, sad state uh, that we uh, that we have to address this. And this is the reason that insurance is so important. 
Dr. Mendez, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I concur with the, with Dr. Brown's points. You know, um, insurance is at the key of all of this discussion, but also when you have the insurance, it's make it accessible to the patients. So that's why programs where the patients don't have to go far and you make it easy for them to get their mammogram by reaching out to their communities, having like a mammogram bus or van to be at their communities and having the um, the people within the community advocate for them to have their mammograms where the van or the bus is there. That is really helpful when you don't have insurance and it's made accessible to you to at least take advantage of those services, even if you don't have insurance. But it's at the crux of the problem, insurances. And Dr. Contreras, I'm sure you hear from patients the same issues. Your thoughts and what your advice to them is? Absolutely. I mean, I've had patients that tell me they decide between buying their kids a Halloween costume or proceeding with the treatment that we're recommending. So it's something that these women deal with on a daily basis. In Dade County alone, about 30% of the population is uninsured and 15% of them live below the poverty line. So this is a very real problem for women. Um, access to care, you know, insurance affects access to care, but then also they spend more time away from their jobs, from their families, from their community. Um, so it's an ongoing issue, um, and it's something we really need to work on as a country because women should not die because they don't have the money to pay for their treatment. Absolutely. Mrs. Brinker. Um, I think that what we've, what everyone has said is absolutely true. And, and of course, we're, we're referring also uh, sort of unconsciously to the exploding population in Florida. Some say as many as 2,000 a day. We don't have the medical infrastructure or social in infrastructure to address even people's social determinants of care. And we don't have enough Medicaid, which is a very important mm -hmm. part of insurance for lower resource people. And um, these are very frustrating things. And aside from all that, what we need to have are standard continuum of care programs, which is what we're doing at the Promise Fund. Besides screening people, we're making sure they get into a care stream and that we can support that care stream. But it takes a lot of coordination and it takes a lot of will and really needs to happen in communities as much as in, you know, just depending on a state or a country for financing, really has to be people who take these matters in their hands and make these systems work. And since if you I mentioned the promise fund. That, um, if Absolutely. I can add something to that, you know, even once you're diagnosed, uh, you have to navigate the job that you have. Mm -hmm. You have to navigate the family's uh, uh, responsibilities that you have to get there for follow up for treatment. So one of the things that's even more important is following through for, on treatments so that you can have a better outcome. And those are many obstacles there, again, uh, trying to get there for the follow up. We know the follow up is very uh, challenging for women uh, and particularly for women who are, who are limited resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Yeah. I want to stay on the health insurance issue, if possible, because I have some numbers I'd like to share with our viewers. And Mrs. Brinker, I'm sure you know this, and it actually surprised me. Look at this. In Palm Beach County, Florida, this is an example right here. More than 80,000 women ages 18 to 64 have no health insurance coverage. Again, Palm Beach County, mm -hmm. one of the wealthiest communities in the country. You mentioned the Promise Fund, uh, Mrs. Brinker. How can we change these numbers? Well, we have to work very hard to make people aware because it's a sort of a almost unbelievable that they come to a, a region of our state, Florida now being the third largest state, Palm Beach being the third largest county, and it's just hard to imagine that uh, th that people are living, you know, in these conditions and have this low level of care. So, with the Promise Fund, what we've vowed, vowed to do is to provide screening for as many of these 80,000 women as we can who have no uh, medical home, who have no insurance, no Medicaid. And one, there's, there's one positive factor, and that is that we're paired with the federally qualified healthcare system, which actually is one of the better systems in our country. A lot of people don't know about it, but they render uh, an Obamacare style primary care. And people are people. They will accept what you have to pay. If you have five dollars, if you have a Medicaid or a Medicare, uh, um, you know, support or any kind of insurance, uh, they will take that and try to fit the pieces together. But this only really extends to good primary care, and that's why it makes sense to take the systems we have, add what we need, 
in terms of early surgery, particularly with women's diseases, colposcopy for cervical cancer, a needle stick biopsies for breast cancer diagnosis, and be able to blend the, these things together and create real access and affordability to a lot more people. Thank you, Mrs. Brinker. I want to share a personal story from friend and advisor, Mamie Kisner from Tabernacle Baptist Church. Let's look at her story. Most of the women from the urban community do not get the information. Many of them are afraid of these kinds of tests. They really don't know where to go. Um, and even if they find um, that there are places for them to go, transportation is a huge problem. First step by Promise Fund to do something like this is going to save lives, and we know that. And we believe that generational lives will be saved. We can now have a place where someone can talk to women of color and all nationalities in our community, and they feel they're important. I think the Promise Fund comes from the heart. Very special story. Uh, Mrs. Brinker, any thoughts on what she had to say? I know she's a good friend. She is a very good friend. And Mamie and I have had many discussions late in the night about how we can give people confidence to come to the services after we provide the transportation and be able to come back on a regular basis. Some people that we help honestly are afraid to give us their last names because they're afraid they'll get a bill and that they can't afford. And that's heartbreaking. So with the help of the navigators that we have, community-based navigators, who are people who are an intersection between a social worker and a nurse, it really works well because they create these relationships with people in their communities of the same language, of the same culture, and bring them to our center. And not just a screening center, but this continuum of care, which we're going to build with some donated services. Uh, we have a lot of for-profit hospitals in Palm Beach County and that really doesn't help very much. And building a lot of specialty hospitals, but they don't have emergency rooms. And the only place you can get care mandated uh, in an emergency room uh, is, is by the state. But specialty hospitals won't even have those kind of emergency rooms. So we're working very hard on every part of the problem. And we're really aggregating the services that we can and the volunteer ability we have in our county to fix this. We just can't let this grow, and it will not be a good outcome if we do. We want our community to be as lovely and wonderful as it can be for everyone. And if you'd like to get in touch with the Promise Fund of Florida, let's show you the web address and phone number. Uh, the website is right there, promisefundoflorida.org, promisefundoflorida.org, and the phone number 877 Four two seven seven six six four. We're actually going to show that website and phone number a little later in the program, so stay tuned for that. Yeah. Uh, I want to turn now to access to care and follow-up care. We talked a little bit about it, uh, but look, let's look at this. According to the National Cancer Institute, it's not just the initial breast cancer mammogram screenings. It's also like follow-up care. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Claire had much to say about that. Let's listen, and we'll talk about it right after. The importance of advocacy um, so, so really that's, that's the role that I play. That's an important role that I play for my patients. So, um, really not being, uh, discouraged by, by challenges, but really doing whatever I can within the power that I have to, to be able to get the patients, uh, what they need to be screened appropriately, to get the follow-up that they need. Um, all that is extremely, extremely important. Working with my, my, my other physician colleagues to again, work together to get the patients, the treatment that they need, um, is really, really important. I think we could spend hours talking about advocacy. But Dr. <laughs> Brown, I'm gonna to go to you. We really can and we should. It's just imperative, isn't it, doctor? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it is imperative that patients have follow-up. And this is where the support systems come in. 
you know, if it's a church member, and in our case with the Promise Fund, it's a navigator, but not everybody has access to a navigator. Mm -hmm. So someone who can help encourage them to take them through all the fears that they're going through, to be supportive with them uh, is very, very key to that follow-up and saying, you can do this, you can do this. I think that's the biggest uh, uh, ch uh, challenge sometimes a women face as they are, um, and they do get discouraged. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Contreras, in many cases, it could truly be a turning point for that patient, for that person. Absolutely. So, you know, these women follow up is incredibly important because it's where we catch toxicities. Are these patients having side effects that are affecting their quality of life, right? Do they have a recurrence that we're not catching? So follow up is incredibly important because it will affect their outcomes. And we know there's evidence that shows that cancer patients are have a lot of anxiety related to, can, to cancer care follow up. Um, so that can often dissuade patients. So one thing we've discussed in, in, in combination with the Promise Fund is to increase healthcare literacy to these patients by directly um, reaching them through their community centers or churches or the way you know that these patients receive the bulk of their information. And, and I'm actually while gonna we're share talking personal about experience. It. Go ahead, Mrs. Breaker. Oh, I'm so sorry. While I'm, um, while just one more thing to mention, Olga, if patients don't feel secure this way, and if they don't have um, enough courage, also it is about, it really is about the cost. Um, we did a, a study and found out that stage four breast cancer can cost as much as $134,000 a year out of pocket, out of someone's pocket, if it's an insurer or a payer or, or the patient. And so it's to everybody's credit to discover these diseases early and create a continuum of care and follow it and make sure it becomes a standard of care, not just a temporary solution. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. And Olga, if, may, and I, if I may, uh, so, you know, we have such a heterogeneous population in the United States uh, that it's important to deliver all these measures in a culturally sensitive way so that it hits them home because that follow-up is so important and that early detection that we've been talking about here. So being culturally sensitive is key uh, for us to accomplish this all across the country. Right. Right. I'd like to and follow, that follow up, up with is that. so important. Yes, Dr. Brown. I'd like to follow up with that because one of the misconceptions again is people, including the treatment, you know, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to have my breast completely removed. What is this gonna do to me? Uh, so forth and so on. And I think that they are hearing stories of what might have happened in the past as opposed to what has happened with the evolution of surgery uh, in the future. And so I think this is also important once they see that provider and have that consultation, that it really be very sensitive about what their fears are, including what's gonna happen to their breasts. And I do wanna just uh, share something quickly and I don't like to make things about me, but I wanna make it about Dr. Mendez, who I'm gonna throw kudos to with something that happened to me a few months ago. And this was something that caught me off guard. I had my yearly mammogram. I had an ultrasound because I have very dense breasts. And I was actually asked to return in eight weeks. And I was alarmed because it had never happened to me before. And they had noticed some swelling of the lymph nodes on the left side. So when I returned eight weeks later, again, follow-up, coming back getting more answers. It turns out everything was actually fine. It was a false reading. And the inflammation could have occurred because I got the COVID vaccine shot. So Dr. Mendez, I wanna bring you in because I did reach out to you, a trusted friend, yeah. and you explained to me what was happening. And I think it's important to create that awareness because it was a, it was a frightening few weeks for me. So you're absolutely uh, right, Olga. And obviously it was great that you called me so that I could assuage your fears and your you know, concerns. Uh, but turns out that once we started the vaccination process, this became a phenomenon. Certainly the lymph nodes that drain the area of the arm where the vaccine is the, you know, injected, is also the same lymph nodes that drain the breast. So certainly not knowing whether it was secondary to the vaccine or secondary to something, an ongoing process in the breast, it was important to have you come for follow-up. 
So during, as soon as we identified this phenomenon, certain lot of women were hesitant about getting their mammograms or getting the vaccine. So it became very important to deliver the message that that should not deter women from getting the vaccine, nor should it deter them from getting their screening mammograms, as a lot of them had actually delayed getting their screening mammogram because of the pandemic, and a lot of breast imaging centers were closed. So this was just a normal physiologic reaction to the vaccination process. So I'm glad that you reached out to me and that everything turned out okay. And Dr. Contreras, I just want your thoughts on this, and I want to make it clear, I'm not saying not to get the COVID vaccine. I am a major, major proponent of the vaccine. I just wasn't made aware of the situation. Dr. Mendez helped me. Do you see this as well? I see it all the time, and I see it on PET scans for my patients with cervical cancer after I've convinced them to get the vaccine. So it's something we see frequently, and that's why, honestly, open communication with your patients is so important obtaining a thorough history, and you only get that information for, from patients if they trust you. So I completely support the COVID vaccine. I encourage it in all of my patients that are candidates. And I think just talking to them about the possibility of seeing lymph nodes is all we need to do to clarify this issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, you know, so you know and uh, something, I, you know, power, you know, empowering the patients with education is something that is really important in any language that it might be needed. Because I think once the patients understand the processes or the need for follow up or the complexity of their situation, they're more willing to adhere to the recommendations that we provide. And that's, you know, the number one component for better outcomes. And better um, outcomes. Olga, that's what the, we all want. The, um, the work that's going on now at MCI, for example, and, and some other cancer institutes as well, is, is deciding and figuring out how to bring the patient into the care stream and lower the cost of treatment. And often the cost of treatment isn't just the dollar amount, but it is the time. For example, most women with stage one or two breast cancer get diagnosed with some radiation, perhaps, depending on the tumor. And I'm not the physician, all these <laughs> with us today are. But they're working on looking at, in a trial to determine if fewer radiation treatments that are slightly stronger would suffice to help the patient just as much as having 20 treatments. The reason those kinds of things work is that most people, um, when, when we talk about lower resource, we talk about the working poor. We talk about people who are just making it through their lives. And to have to do something for 20 days or 40 days and leave your job, mm -hmm. we know where that's going to lead to a lot of times, no job. So these are all issues we're concerned mm -hmm. with at the Promise Fund. It's not just one or two things, it's many pieces of the puzzle that need to work together. And the more we're able to work with each other, uh, such as we do with uh, MCI, um, it, it's so much more helpful to everybody in the long run. And what Ms. Brinker is alluding to is we've developed a relationship between the Promise Fund and MCI to really conduct these studies um, to understand the barriers that women face when looking for treatment, whether it's for breast or cervical cancer. Um, we're currently working on a specific study to decrease the number of treatments for these women to make it more convenient. Um, we're providing treatment at no cost through philanthropic support. We're ensuring that these women receive evidence-based treatment because even Black and Hispanic women that are diagnosed with early stage disease are less likely to, to receive the most contemporary treatment available to them. And we're doing all of this in the patient's native language with patient navigators. So really an amazing effort with the Promise Fund to increase access to care for all of these patients in South Florida. And for our viewers, just in case uh, they don't know what MCI stands for, although it's right there uh, on the doctor's white coat, that's Miami Cancer Institute, and it's there on Kendall and 87th Avenue, a beautiful and wonderful facility doing amazing things and, uh, and giving a lot of people hope for the future. I want to turn to Dr. Constant again. She talks specifically about outreach, another important topic. Let's hear what she had to say. You know, there are other communities um, outside of Florida where I've seen just really amazing um, outreach to underserved communities where you have everything together. And um, aside from having like a medical center, they have a like community outreach where you have like boots on the ground, let's say, where they actually speak to patients, bring them in, talk to them, and they're like the liaison between the community and the physicians. So you have like social outreach groups that help you, that tell you the importance, let's help you schedule your appointment, 
let's, you know, let's get you your mammogram. And so I think that that's a person that you can relate to, you can speak to that's trying to help you and has your best interest in mind. At least that's the perception from the patients and from the community. And then they kind of walk you over to your, you know, federally qualified healthcare center or your Affordable Care Act, you know, HMO center. But I think that that is very important. I think that's something that's very helpful to have in the community. I cannot agree more. Dr. Brown, would you like to expand on this as well? Oh, absolutely. You know, we've known for a long time, the more care you can put in the community, the better off you are. And then of course, to providers. Uh, providers have to, again, recognize what the, uh, the, the screening criteria are. So when they do see the person, they can do the appropriate uh, counseling. Uh, again, the idea is one of the things that was brought up is 99.9% .9 of care is caring, uh, caring enough to mm -hmm. be able to kind of go through those things and make sure that there's equitable treatment based on evidence-based guidelines. And I think we still find that to be, uh, you know, somewhat of a concern to us, particularly for people who are who are economically uh, challenged. And so, again, whatever we can do uh, to improve that, uh, we have to do. But having centers like federally qualified health centers, in many of instances, may not necessarily have physicians, but they have women's health nurse practitioners. Very important uh, to the care that women receive. Dr. Mendez, would you like to chime in? Yes, well, I've been very privileged to work in many different communities throughout the United States. First, I started in East Harlem, New York City. Then I went to Boston under Surf City Hospital, and now I'm in South Florida. And for me, it's interesting, irrespective of the setting, we still have to deal with these issues with access to care, as well as how important it is to have that connection with the community. Because the element of trust, the element that they know that they can community and they can come for their care and that you're gonna take good care of them, irrespective of the location that has been key trend to really lead to the patients to adhere to their treatment. It takes time and it takes education, but they finally find a committed physician like Dr. Contreras, who's really vested in this Florida community to lead to that equality of care, respective of location. It's really vital to effect change in what we're talking about here. So there's no question how key that is. And Dr. Contreras, I'm going to add go to that, you. If you don't mind, Olga, is, um, is we've kind of confused women to some degree because of uh, screenings. And we still recognize in the Women's Health Services uh, um, pre Preventive Care Initiative that it's so important to have a yearly a visit, uh, irrespective of the fact you may not be having a cervical cancer screen every year. And so a lot of the confusion will allow women to delay, delay, delay going in and see their provider. And particularly if they have access and have dollar issues, so I don't want to I don't want to discount that as well. Uh, it is important for for women to recognize the criticalness of them having yearly assessments on their health. And one of the most to follow up with that, just I wanted to point out, at least in our experience, one of the most important things for a woman to have, if possible, and and can start off at the federally qualified centers. Uh, is really good primary care because if you're followed by a primary physician at least once a year, you'll have a much better platform to discover something early or to start on a path and find resources to help. Um, also, um, it's very, very important that when, when physicians volunteer to do things, which they have to in our county because we don't have the amount of care we need, we have to provide sovereign immunity for them. They can be sued because there's no tort reform in the state of Florida. So there are all these issues that we as an organization, we're the aggregators of the issues and the outcomes. And uh, every single step here is a barrier, but our philosophy is every barrier is to be just crossed over, figure a way to get over it. Mm -hmm. And if it's good, keep doing it better. You know, Thank you and, so much. and something Olga, something to bring up is how the pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened all these issues that we're talking about here and how much work is taken to get back to normal. We have certainly seen a lot more later stage disease secondary to the pandemic. So it's important to continue to reiterate 
the you know how to stick to getting your mammogram despite what's happened with the pandemic because breast cancer does not discriminate and it's not going to go away. So an early detection is the key. So we have yeah, to continue to fight. That pit, and I agree with what Dr. Mendez just mentioned. You know, the pandemic has affected our patients so much. They're diagnosed at a much later stage. Um, the CDC released a study recently that quoted that screening for breast cancer declined by 87% and 84% mm -hmm. for cervical cancer. And it, this, this decrease in screening was even more pronounced in Hispanic and Black women, up to 84% decrease in Hispanic women. So, you know, I think through a community center and establishing these, the infrastructure where these women have continued follow up will be even more important now because of the effects of the pandemic and, and our underserved populations. And Mrs. Brinker, yeah. you and I were just talking about that before we started the town hall about right. how many people haven't gotten their mammograms, how many people haven't gotten mm -hmm. their colonoscopies. The list mm -hmm. goes on and on and the repercussions of that. Yeah, yeah. the repercussions are. Are, are serious. And if you're lucky enough to have physicians like the physicians with us today, oftentimes they'll help people who have no path. Or even if people are insured, that's really the sadness. People who are insured are not getting their screenings. And it's easy exactly. enough to, to do. It's, it's not comfortable. Uh, colonoscopies are the same way. I know many friends who missed theirs this year. Uh, they were supposed to get them and didn't. And it's these kind of things which then bring on significant cases of cancer, which are very expensive to treat. And I wanna keep talking about the cost because the cost factor is growing at, dramatically for people. And uh, you know, the prescription drug programs don't always work to anybody's credit. And many, many things that, that happen in, until healthcare becomes the single most ex greatest expense any family bears. Yeah. It is. Dr. Mendez, you had mentioned about community and you mentioned Dr. Contreras and her involvement in the community. Uh, I want to show our viewers uh, this soundbite with Dr. Claire. She actually talks about the importance of getting the messages out to the community. So let's listen in. And Dr. Contreras, I'm going to have you react right after. Take a listen. Using the community, our community partners, not only physicians speaking to patients, but trusted messengers in the communities, in the barber shops, in the beauty shops to tell them, oh, a mammogram is important, a beauty shop in particular for black women. That's a trusted place where they, you get your hair done all the time, you get your nails done. Using those additional helpers, right, to advocate for your health care is very, very important. So not only the physician, not only the, the nurse, not only the other healthcare professionals, but other people that really are helping us really get the word out that you need to get your mammograms on a routine basis. You need to get all the screening tests is really, really important. And I find that's very helpful in, in helping me uh, get the, my patients what they need. And I, I love what she said, Dr. That. Contreras. Because, I'm sorry. And the churches. But, but uh, even at La Carreta or Vesarius having a Cuban coffee, Dr. Contreras, anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the community breaks down every barrier, right? If we're reaching these patients through their pastor, their best friend, their hairdresser, that's gonna be way more effective than anything I could ever do because they know them and they trust them, right? So I think as a physician and as a healthcare entity, we need to be do a better job of establishing these relationships with the community to really benefit our patients. Um, it, it directly addresses several of the social determinants of health that these women face, right? We have access to care, we'll have, um, healthcare literacy, we can we can directly address these issues by establishing these relationships with the community. But it's not only the initial establishment of these relationships, we really have to have continued engagement, right? It's showing the community that what you're trying to do is actually benefiting the patients. It's showing them what you've done from, um, from an institutional perspective. So definitely an incredibly important portion of the care. And that's why establishing relationships with um, institutions like the Promise Fund, local organizations, um, it's really so important for these patients. And Dr. Another, Brown, you mentioned- If I, I add church. to that, uh, I mentioned churches because uh, I've done so many women's health fairs uh, in churches, particularly when I lived in Indianapolis. And the idea was, you know, if you go in there and you're a member of the congregation, you're a trusted person. And as a physician, I could deliver certain types of messages. I could talk about screenings. I could talk about all those things. So important to have those engagements. So when you have 
you know, providers, nurses, doctors who live in those uh, environments, it becomes very, very important to be able to use those and dialogue uh, for better health care. And, and that, I so agree with that. I so agree with that. The, the uh, video you saw on Mamie Kistner, for example, her husband, Pastor Kistner, who runs the Tabernacle Church, uh, himself has had a family member who had breast cancer. And he came the day we opened our center and gave a blessing to it and told us the story of his daughter. And frankly, it is, it is these kinds of stories that make people really understand what we're talking about. Storytelling is an important part of care, we find, and particularly to deal with fear. Uh, telling a story about either someone you knew or in the family and, and what you learned and uh, explaining how better outcomes can be had. So um, I would totally concur with everything everyone has said about that. You know I'm gonna what? actually move and, uh, on to viewer questions, but I'd like Dr. Mendez to chime in. Yeah, so actually another component that we cannot forget is the support groups and being able to share your story with other people who can, you can relate to who have gone through these same experiences because that oftentimes empowers the patient and strengthens them to go through the breast cancer journey. And the same way the role that family and friends play as part of the mm -hmm. breast cancer journey mm -hmm. in helping us, the patients get through it and adhere with the follow-up and uh, the care that we are recommending. So support groups and family are kind of a fourth dimension of care that we cannot ignore to achieve what we're talking about. Great information. Um, I have some viewer questions that I'd like to get to from our audience. So if you'll permit me, we have quite a few and we've got about uh, 15 minutes left in this fabulous town hall. Uh, the first one, there's no name, but this is what she writes. I am a black woman and I wanna know if I have a genetically higher risk of breast cancer simply because of my race. Dr. Brown, I'm gonna give that one to you. Uh, let me just say, unless you carry the uh, the BRCA gene uh, or one of the genes, you don't have a higher risk. That's the highest risk group. But I want to talk about most, the fact that most breast cancers are sporadic. And we now have new data that takes in association not only your race, uh, your environment, your diet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that will ultimately cal recalculate your genetic risk for developing cancer. And so if you take your fences, you may have a, a cousin or you may have a, an aunt, or you may have had different people who are not necessarily genetic, but the reality is there may indeed be a little bit higher risk because when you take all these things in consideration, uh, the calculation of your risk based on something we now know are called you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms that you may have uh, may indeed increase your risk. So risk scoring is very important, but uh, Overall, race alone does not increase your risk. Dr. Mendez, a few words on this? Well, we know that there are certain um, ethnic groups, uh, specifically the Ashkenazi Jewish population, that have the highest prevalence of the BRCA genes that are the most uh, commonly associated with breast cancer. However, there's many other genes that are also associated with breast cancer. We know that a younger African-American women tend to be diagnosed with what are called triple negative breast cancers, and sometimes those may be associated with the BRCA genes. So certainly race alone, I concur with Dr. Brown, does not lead to genetic testing, but it's a combination of factors. And we do some re-stratification to help us assess whether somebody needs to see the genetic counselors or not. And I think you mentioned the question. recalculation of a person's risk once you see them and they bring these type of fears to you. We can reassess right. their risk right. based on what they say, which may put them in a higher risk group than someone who would routinely uh, be a next door neighbor uh, with no family history or no uh, concerns. Mm -hmm. This question just came I in and uh, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I just was going to ask one question of the panel. Um, I wonder whether uh, all of you feel that it is important for public figures to, to tell their stories. Uh, we just saw that uh, Mrs. DeSantis was uh, diagnosed mm -hmm. uh, sadly with breast cancer, a lovely young woman, very intelligent and leading a wonderful life. And that's how it can uh, attack once it, you know, breast cancer can 
it is everyone's at risk for it really. But um, public figures often help people also deal with this by watching their journey. Um, Betty Ford was a great friend of mine and, and, and did that for, I think, our public in the day in 1974 before anybody was even talking about the disease. So um, I would encourage everyone who knows someone who's a public spokesperson in a community and particularly people of color and uh, particularly elderly or middle-aged Jewish women, you're right, it's a very common disease. Um, and the more people who will speak out and educate, the more it becomes palatable for a person who's already got a battle on their hands to, to feel mm -hmm. not so alone. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I concur. I concur that it's very important for public figures. You know, it has a huge platform. And uh, for those who have gone public with their story, I think they've changed so many people's lives downstream that uh, provided they're given accurate information, it's a great way to get headway in this breast cancer uh, war that we have and that you started, Nancy. <laughs> no, it definitely normalizes everything, right? And it shows that we're all vulnerable, that, you know, breast cancer doesn't discriminate and it really helps people understand the journey and steps along the way. So completely agree with everything that's been said. It also increases funding when Go famous ahead, people Brown. do those yeah. type of things. It increases funding because the awareness of it, yeah. it makes a big difference. Look at what happened, you know, with uh, the, the current president's former vice president, uh, when his son Bo had brain cancer, all the funding mm -hmm. that started to flow mm -hmm. in and the philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So these type mm -hmm. of public figures can help us do the things that we need to do in order to take the best care of women and get them in and get them screened and so forth. And, and it also gives those of us who do this work courage to know that it has helped people. Like, for example, we're doing a new pink, pink boots on the ground campaign. I have mine on today. You can't see them, but We've all decided and committed to wear our boots everywhere uh, during the month of breast cancer awareness and beyond. So we can make sure that people understand that this is these are the boots you walk in um, when you're going through this. And it's somehow a symbol helps people also think about what they can do to help. It's very important that everybody helps um, in this and, and all of the cancer efforts and particularly those that affect low resource people. I hear a question and I'd like to actually um, talk about this quickly because a lot of people hear different ages. So one question that just came in, when should I get a mammogram? Some people hear once a year, twice a year, age 40, age 50. Uh, Dr. Mendez, I'm going to have you start with this one and what the... Uh, yes, well, the, the American Cancer Society, yeah, so the American Cancer Society, as well as the Miami Cancer Institute of Baptist Health of Florida, we recommend mammograms starting at age 40 and annually thereafter. Uh, because we think that it's important to detect, you know, this has been an area of great controversy over the past like decade, but those are our recommendations. All right. Uh, another question that just came in that I'd like to get to. Uh, this viewer writes, I have a family history of breast cancer and two of my sisters have been diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm so sorry. I'm considering having my breast removed, but I'm not sure it's the right thing for me. And she writes, I do not have the BRCA mutation. Uh, Dr. Contreras? Yeah, so, you know, I think that's a very personalized decision. It's not a decision that one should take lightly. You know, you have to consider many factors. You have to balance where this individual is in life, um, whether they can stick to a, a, a more regular, rigorous uh, follow-up schedule with screening, with um, diagnostic mammography or even MRI. So, you know, I it's hard to say because I do think that's a personalized decision and it's a discussion to be had with your surgeon. If no, I may add to that, I think that she does indeed need to. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I think the scoring is very different than someone who is sporadic. And so, again, the reasons that it may screen, uh, change the screening paradigm for her, you know, compared to uh, even without the BRCA gene, as I said, because of uh, many uh, polymorphisms that are out there that may actually put her in a different category of risk. And so, I think that's really important for her to have the kind of 
maybe the genetic, even gene, even if she doesn't have a genetic risk, to have the genetic counseling that may uh, play a role in those type of things. I only have about three minutes left in this show. So I'm gonna ask you all for final thoughts. Uh, again, maybe 30 seconds each of you. I think it's always important to end with uh, hope and, uh, and awareness. So I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Mendez. I think it's amazing the journey we've been in breast cancer over the past 40 years. You know, with early detection, we had 98.5% survival at 10 years, which is remarkable. You know, testament to all the incredible research and the increased awareness education that we've had. So I think we have a lot of work to do, but um, I think with continued programs like this one, we'll continue to beat breast cancer. So I have a lot of hope. Dr. Contreras. I echo Dr. Mendez. I am incredibly hopeful of the future. Sometimes it's difficult to see that hope given everything that's happened over the last two years, right? So, but you do have to remember that there are amazing people out there that are willing to help and will do everything in their power to help. You know, we have amazing organizations here in South Florida. So I am hopeful that things will improve and at some point we'll have equal access to care and equal outcomes for all of our patients. Thank you so much. Dr. Brown. I totally agree. And my one message to everyone, do not delay screening. Do not delay screening, particularly if you're a woman who is at the age where you need to uh, be screened. And one, I just know that I've seen patients preconceptually who are going for infertility treatments. They're over 40. And I said, well, have you had your mammogram? No, it might interfere with me getting pregnant. Don't do it because I've taken care of too many pregnant women who have had breast cancer. And Mrs. Brinker. Well, thank you. I am so proud of the people who are on the panel today. I know everyone individually, and we are so lucky today versus 50 years ago, what we have in terms of the property, the intellectual uh, physicians, scientists, and community workers and advocates who are working on this problem. And it is my dearest hope that before too long, we will have a new era of public health, true public health, rendered in a community where nobody is afraid to access care and everybody has care and has a feeling that they are cared for, not just care, but cared for. And um, I'm very delighted that you did this, this panel today. I respect all these individuals so much and they are a very important part of our effort going forward. Um, Please join my friend Mamie Kisner and me um, as the uh, and month after next when we do our, our pink boots campaign. And we all want you to come and wear your pink boots and we look forward to it. And thank you very much, um, so much, Olga, for doing such a great job today. Oh, thank you so much. I know I got about 40 seconds and a viewer just sent me this question. So Dr. Mendez, in 10 seconds or less, she writes, I am a breast cancer survivor of seven years. Can I get the third COVID shot? Yes, take it. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And on absolutely. that note, yes, absolutely. And one absolutely. more question: Does it it does it increase the tumor markers? That question just came in. No. 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 Easy enough. Okay, I did promise <laughs> Mrs. Brinker that I would show her my pink boots. She actually sent me two. So I took a picture with her. I left mine downstairs. I don't have them. <laughs> I did receive I them, Nancy, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got Thank mine you all on for today, too. <laughs> God bless all of you. Thanks. A great panel, a great town hall. And I thank you all for joining us here on the Health Channel. I'm Olga Villaverde. And as always, we'll see you next time. You take care. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Support for this program is provided by Baptist Health 
through the John and Margaret Krupa Distinguished Chair Fund.